everyone. Today we in the orthopedic tutor we will be talking about the median nerve compression neuropathy. As you have probably seen in my previous videos, I've gone over the basics regarding compression neuropathy and also the carpal tunnel syndrome, which is one of the most common syndrome found in the upper extremity that has a relation with compression neuropathy. Today, we are going to discuss two different types of compression neuropathy, which is the anterior interosseous nerve compression neuropathy and also the pronator syndrome. I reserve these two in this video because these two syndromes are not as commonly found in the upper limb as the carpal tunnel syndrome. Well, let's get started with the first one, which is the anterior interosseous nerve compression neuropathy. Well, you need to know the location first for this condition because this is in relation with the anterior interosseous branch of the median nerve you need to know that in the in, for the median nerve over at the forearm region the median gives us a motoric branch which is called the anterior interosseous nerve this is kind of like the one's branch that the radial nerve has which is the posterior interosseous nerve so for this condition as you might have guessed because it occur at the anterior interosseous nerve only then the deficit should only be a motoric deficit and therefore you need to know the muscles that the AIN supply which is these three important muscles which is the FPL or flexor pollicis longus the FDP which is the flexor digitorum profundus that goes to the index and middle finger and also the pronator quadratus. You need to know that there are two pronator muscles, the one that is more proximal is the pronator teres, and the one at the distal is pronator quadratus. So in order to check these muscles, you just need to ask the patient to twist their wrist around in a pronation sort of like movement, and you need to make them do a okay sign. By doing so, you are actually evaluating these three muscles. You twist the wrist uh, in using the pronator quadratus. You ask them to do a OK sign by activating the FPL and also FDP. Next is, you need to know that the AIN syndrome is associated with the Parsonage Turner syndrome. But in usually in this uh, syndrome, you can find bilateral AIN sign. Next is the anatomical variant that you need to get yourself known, uh, which is the Martin Gruber anastomosis. This is a uh, anomaly, anomaly in the human anatomy in which around 15% of population may have fibers that come out of the AIN and they cross over to connect to the ulnar nerve and innovate the other muscle group as you know that the ulnar nerve uh, innervates the intrinsic muscles in the hand and therefore even though that the compression neuropathy happens at the AIN nerve the patient may present with intrinsic muscle weakness so complicated but you need to get yourself used to these terms because there's also other anastomosis such as the ridge canoe anastomosis and there's also um, uh, anastomosis that goes from the ulnar nerve to the median nerve or you just need to have yourself mem memorizing all these names because it will indeed help you one day to f when you see cases that are uh, unusual cases the compression goes at the a side but the symptoms lead to more like a b syndrome and next is talking about the entrapment. The AIN nerve can be entrapped in various sites, but there are certain sites that are more common than the other. I'm going to show you this picture here. Okay, so this is a picture showing the median nerve, but also at the same time, the AIN branch of the median nerve. So the tendinous portion of the deep head of the pronator teres, this is the pronator teres, and the proximal edge here, these are the sites that 
the AI end nerve is most commonly compressed at. So this is this area here is particularly important. The next goes from the FDS arcade, but it also could come from the edge of the lacertus fibrosus, which is the. Okay, I'm going to show you this picture. Oh, I'm sorry, I do not have those picture that depicts the lacertus fibrosus. But other source of compression includes the Ganser muscle. The Ganser muscle is a accessory head of the flexor pollicis longus. Not all human beings have this muscle, but when it is there, it can cause this AIN syndrome. Okay, and next, after knowing all the potential sites of AIN syndrome, you what you could do is you could do a good physical exam because you already know that the patient shall present with motor deficits only and no pain. And the physical and findings should reveal that the patient is unable to make a okay sign because the three muscles affect are affected. And you could also test the pronator quadratus weakness in maximum elbow flexion because when you do pro pronation movement of the arm uh, the forearm sorry with the elbow in extension you are actually testing the pronator teres instead of the pronator quadratus so be re uh, always reminded that you should do elbow flexion before you do pronation if you want to isolate this muscle Next is the additional examination, which is the same for most types of compression neuropathy. You need to do EMG and CV. And I have made discussions regarding this in our in the previous video. So for the management of the AIN compression neuropathy, first line management is always only conservative management. You only need to observe the patient ask the patient to do some resting and apply splint with the elbow placed in around 90 degree for around two to three months basically you just want to rest the soft tissue that is around the elbow to allow all those swellings all those irritations that goes on to just quite reduce on its own and therefore hopefully the compression will be gone but sometimes you also need to do decompression of the ai and Nerve. and this is only indicated when the non-operative measures have failed technique include release of the superficial fds and also the lacertus fibrosis this is the fibrous arch that goes from the biceps i think i have a picture of it somewhere around here and the technique will include uh, releasing both of these and also detaching the superficial head of the pronator uh, Terrace muscle, as you've known, that the proximal edge of the pronator terrace is the most frequent cause of the AIN syndrome. And you need to ligate any crossing vessels and remove any space occupying lesion. For the post management, it's generally the same. You need to uh, be aware of the compression, uh, uh, the recurrence that might occur as part of the complication. And the surgical decompression is generally only around 75 success rate, percent success rate. Satisfactory is best when uh, the operation is done within three to six months after the symptom onset. Next, we're going to move on to the pronator syndrome. So the pronator syndrome is, it involves the median nerve and not the AIN branch of the median nerve. So generally, you can find it in patients with well-developed forearm muscles because as you can see here that the compression sites are over at the forearm region and in patients with weightlifting habits they have this really huge hypertrophied muscles that may compress on the nerve over at the elbow region but sometimes it is also associated with medial epicondylitis as you can see here in this image here this very good image you could see here that the median nerve giving off all its branches to the muscles here starting from those that goes to the pronator terrace those who go to the palmaris longus and so on and so on up to all those tena muscles here and you can see here that this is a branch that goes off to the 
three muscles, which is the flexor digitorum profundus, the flexor pollicis longus, and also to the pronator quadratus. This little branch here is called as the AIN or anterior interosseous nerve. And the pronator syndrome is the compression neuropathy that happens all around here, the elbow region. But it only compresses the more the median nerve aspect of this nerve but not the AIN and therefore what makes this sort of compression neuropathy different from the uh, AIN is that there will be sensory deficit so the five side that is most commonly associated with the pronator syndrome are the supra supracondylar process you could see here that sometimes there are supracondylar process along with the ligament of stratus that attaches to the medial aspect of the uh, sorry to the lateral aspect of the uh, distal humerus here and these are one of the areas where the median nerve may be compressed next would be between the ulna and the humeral head of the pronator terus muscle so between these two heads the muscle goes through and become compressed but it could also become compressed due to the FDS or flexor digitorum arch you could see here that the flexor digitorum has a fibrous arch that attach these muscles to the, the muscles surrounding it and this is one of the compression site other compression site would be the lacertus fibrosus which is the bicipital aponeurosis that comes from the bicep standard these not only are able to compress the median nerve but also it has a potential to compress the anterior anterior interosseous nerve so now that you know the sites of compression the classification is for compression neuropathy once again are the same we have discussed it earlier at the compression neuropathy video it is this classification which is divided into the early intermediate or late type of compression neuropathy and next what i would like to discuss is how to make a good diagnosis so basically now that you know what is the area of compression you need to know that the symptoms they could be a paresthesias over at three and a half radial hand as seen in the carpal tunnel syndrome because you would expect it to be the same because it occur proximal to the carpal tunnel syndrome so the symptoms should be quite similar and the symptoms could be worse in repetitive pronosupination because you know that the nerve here is situated over at the pronator terrace so when you do a pronosupination kind of movement you're actually triggering the compression there what makes this syndrome different from cts is that you need to know that there are no night symptoms because any wrist flexion that occur during night time will not provoke further compression or at the pronator syndrome type of patient and what makes it different is that in pronator syndrome you might find some aching complaints over at the proximal volar forearm this is due to the local irritation of the nerve over at that side and you could also see that there could be a sensory distribution uh, loss over at the palmar cutaneous branch of median nerve if you go through my previous video that shows uh, that talks about the carpal tunnel syndrome I have discussed extensively there what can be expected to be found and you can see here that this area that is usually not effective not affected in the carpal tunnel syndrome is indeed affected in the pronator syndrome because the branch it goes around four to five centimeter proximal to the carpal tunnel so this area is still affected when you have a pronator syndrome and you need to check this area too to make it to differentiate it from the carpal tunnel syndrome in carpal tunnel syndrome you will only expect to see findings over here at the median nerve digital branches and over here which is the exclusive area of the median nerve okay moving on we need to know how to do a good physical findings because the provocative test is quite different when with the ones in the carpal tunnel syndrome what you want to provoke here is the muscles around the elbow 
Once again, what you want to provoke here are the muscles around the elbow because there is where this uh, pronator syndrome is happening. So you need to do resisted elbow flexion with elbow supinated to trigger the compression over at the bicipital aponeurosis. The next is you need to do resisted pronation with elbow extended to test the pronator teres because when you do pronation with elbow in flexion, what you are testing is actually the pronator quadratus. Next is you need to do a resisted middle finger FDS contraction to trigger the compression over at the FDS fibrous arch. Now, knowing all that, the additional examination is generally the same, but besides EMG and CV, you could also do a plane radiograph to detect this little supracondylar process here over at the medial side here. You could see this uh, little supracondylar process. Okay, and then next is the management plan. So now that you know your patient has this pronator syndrome, you generally do non-operative modalities, the usuals, the rest, splinting, and NSAIDs. But the splinting here is focused on forearm rotation. You need to limit that movement so that the patient can rest. Now for the operative treatment modalities should include surgical decompression for patients who have failed non-operative treatment method for three to six months and you need to decompress all those five sites of compression that we have talked earlier. For the post-management, well, the prognosis for this condition in the surgical decompression usually provide around 80% relief. Now you need to learn these syndromes as a whole which includes pronator syndrome ain syndrome and also carpal tunnel syndrome to help you a to be able to differentiate these three syndromes and to able to point out which are the area the true area of decompression that you're going to do it will be disastrous if you diagnose someone with carpal tunnel syndrome when they actually have pronator syndrome and after surgery finding that there is no improvement of symptoms then you will definitely get into a huge trouble that will be all for today's video be sure to check out my other video regarding compression neuropathy of the median nerve